اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد مومن از از ٹائم فار مولانا از اسپیچ انشاء اللہ از آلموسٹ ایٹ او کلاک اینڈ وی ول کنٹینیو دس پروگرام آف اسپیچ اینڈ اف وی ہیو انف ٹائم لیفٹ دین وی ول ہیو اے دعا افتتا بیفور مغرب اف ناٹ دین انشاء اللہ ٹو نائٹ وی ول ہیو اے دعا افتتا رائٹ آفٹر صلاحت مغرب این پر محمد و علی محمد صلوات اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد و الثناء للہ رب العالمین بارئ الخلائق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب قلوبنا و طبیب نفوسنا و شفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم المصطفى محمد و على اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المکرمین المنتجبین لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقتمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our Imam, please recite a salawat. We mentioned in the previous sessions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with a great opportunity. He blesses us every year with this opportunity. The opportunity of the month of Ramadan, a month that He has said one night alone in it is better than a thousand months. He refers to it, He says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ What do you know? Refer to the Holy Prophet, not to us. To his Prophet, he says, you even don't know how great this night is. All right. Only one night in this month is that great. The Holy Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us some of the blessings. For instance, every night the angels call from the heavens, is there anyone that is willing to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the ulama looking at the ahadith in regards to it say in this month God is looking for an excuse to forgive people. Looking for an excuse to forgive people. You don't have to do much to be forgiven in this month. That's why the hadith says a person who enters the month of Ramadan and leaves and they haven't even been able to have their sins forgiven is a very, very misfortunate and unfortunate person. Shaqi is the word that is used in the hadith. So we have this great opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make sure we benefit from this, He has made fast an obligation by avoiding the regular blessings, the physical, material blessings that we benefit from and we enjoy on a daily basis, by avoiding them we're allowing our spirit to grow. Okay, so we said that we want to inshallah try to, try our best to enrich this experience, to do a little more, to go beyond the norms, to try to go beyond the bare minimums. As we mentioned, we have to get this straight in our head. For those who've read Imam Khomeini's 40 Hadith, a very, very great book. Alhamdulillah, it's one of the books that even the translation is roughly good at least. It's, it's understandable. Unfortunately, some of those books that are translated, for those who've read them, 
they're not very understandable. Uh, this book, Alhamdulillah, is understandable at least, the translation of it. It's a very, very good book to read for those who are looking to try to develop themselves, develop their souls, try to become true human beings, try to become Khalifatullah. He says there in the first hadith, and this is a fact, that being able to avoid all sin and to make sure we perform all the obligations, we don't miss any of them, this is definitely doable by non-ma'sumin. You can have someone that develops and makes themselves ma'sum in the sense that they don't commit any sin. Because the isma that the Ahlul Bayt have is far beyond this. Okay? The Ahlul Bayt, it's not a... Uh, it's not very difficult to avoid all sin. They're not great because they don't commit sins. Sins are nothing to them. What they are best at is that, as a verse of the Holy Quran says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَن ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ No matter what they are engaged in, the most material activities, such as shopping. Shopping is the most material, I think, for me. I hate shopping. You go over there, sisters love shopping. <laughs> um, and, and going out shopping with one's wife, that sometimes becomes a, a little difficult. But spending that time just looking at all those items that are there, the glamour of the dunya. You enter that store, whether it's Walmart or, I don't know, Costco or Sam's or whatever the store you go to, you go there, you have a list of five things, you come out with 10, 15 or 20. Uh, the cart is loaded. At least it was before the economic crisis. I don't know what it is like now. But the glamour of the dunya, you go there to shop, you're seeing the different items that are there on the shelves, you just want all of them, all right? So it's very material. It's very difficult to be there and be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't having a tasbih and just saying la ilaha illallah, la ilaha. You could be saying la ilaha illallah and committing a sin. There's a funny story. I think maybe it's a joke. I don't know how real it is, but... Um, I'll say part of it. Say this guy was looking at this scene that he wasn't supposed to. This lady's passing by with more skin showing than anything. And uh, he keeps looking and like, Subhanallah. You know? well, that's not the dhikr of Allah. All right. The word is said, but that's not really the dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To go and be engaged in the dunya, in the material dunya, in business, and not for a split second forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not easy. It's not easy. The Ahlul Bayt, they were such people. So for us, being able to develop ourselves such that we don't commit a single sin, that's definitely doable. Even beyond that is something that's doable. So we should try to shoot for something that's even more profound than just being able to observe our obligations and avoid sins. In order to do that, we said that inshallah we're going to try to discuss certain issues over the course of these nights to uh, have a better understanding regarding certain topics and then try to find some practical solutions to some of the problems that we're having have some practical steps. What we covered in the previous session was the idea that when we want to identify and define prosperity for ourselves, what we need to make sure we don't even subconsciously get involved with, with is to define prosperity in a material sense, in a material context. A lot of us, even though theoretically we may say that our priorities and our prosperity lies with, for instance, 
following the Ahlul Bayt, which is a very noble goal, an objective. Although we say that, but practically, looking at my own conduct, I really don't see how that holds true in practice. That's not really the case. It's just something that I know should be there, but whether it's there or not is a different story. Okay. So we said we should realize that prosperity is not defined in a material context. It's something that has to do with the hereafter. We recited the verse that says, Life is actually in the hereafter. We haven't been created for this world. No matter how long you live in this world, it's limited, it's finite, and compared to eternity, compared to infinite life, it's incomparable, you can't compare it. And I think we stress that enough. But what we want to talk about today is what is it in the hereafter that we're trying to look for? According to the hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu oh. alayhi There are different reasons why people worship. We're going to go over some of those and try to understand them based on some of the verses of the Holy Quran. The hereafter, what happens? And how do we define how do we define prosperity in the context of the hereafter? The first thing is what we don't want to be ending up in. That's the first thing that we need to make clear for ourselves. We need to be aware and keep ourselves aware of certain things that will happen in the hereafter, starting with the Day of Judgment onwards, and for some, God forbid, for many maybe, even right after death, that we really, really want to avoid. These are realities. When you want to make a journey somewhere, when you want to drive somewhere, if there, are if there are dangers on that route, if there are certain things that you need to be aware of so you don't get involved with, then otherwise you can get stuck and you can end up losing your life there. You'll think twice about moving in that direction. You'll be very careful to make sure you don't do that. All right. In the hereafter, there are certain things that when we read the descriptions of, we should be scared to death. And that fear should cause us to move in the right direction. These are things that we, we want to try to avoid. Prosperity is definitely trying to avoid this. All right. When we read the description of even death, Death can be very painful or it can be very enjoyable. You have people that when they die, the way the Holy Quran describes it, it's very scary. It says there are two sets of angels that come to the person. They want to take his life. This disbeliever, which is not necessarily someone that didn't claim to be Muslim. We have very scary stories of people, and we have this in hadith. Sakaratul maut can cause a person to lose faith completely. al billah. God forbid. The actions that we commit, that we perform, they can cause us to lose that faith that we had right at the last moment. I won't get into the story because it's a long story that I have. It's very scary. Now, the disbeliever, at that point, has become a disbeliever. The verses say you have two sets of angels. There are a set of angels behind the person, trying to knock that soul out of the body. And then there's a set of angels on the front side that don't want to allow the soul to leave that body. It's so filthy and disgusting that they don't want it to leave that body, let it stay there. We don't want to smell this body, this soul. So they're banging and knocking onto this soul, 
from this side, and then gradually both sides being knocked on and beaten on by the angels till gradually that soul leaves the body. Right. Very, very painful death it could be. And this is not even material. You think uh, some of the deaths, like a car crash, can actually be very uh, simple. The pain that the person has from a physical perspective may be a split second. All right? But that's not where it ends. That's not the pain. What you see happening to the body is nothing compared to the spiritual pain. All right? Then it moves on to the grave. But then the death of certain people is even enjoyable. They say the shuhada in Karbala. Forget about the Imam, the Ahlul Bayt. The shuhada in Karbala. When they would receive those strikes on their bodies, it's a sword, it's not a joke. It's arrows coming. The person who stood in front of Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi. When the Imam, Imam wanted to pray, a very brave, brave companion. It's amazing. Try to put yourself in his shoes. Try to see if you would be doing that for your Imam. Standing there, he definitely has a shield to try to protect. But at times he sees those arrows coming, the spears coming, and this shield is not enough. He protects the Imam with his body, with his arms, with his legs, with his head. And when the Imam said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, he fell. They counted the arrows in his body with 13 arrows that he kept in his body before he fell. And this man, imagine how much pain you would normally have if you have 13 arrows. And these are just the arrows. God knows how many strikes he's taken. What he turns back to the Imam and says, he says, Afaradit. Are you pleased with me? How can you have, this is not a Hollywood movie. It's not fake. It's not fabricated. This is real. You can't turn around and say that to the Imam unless the physical pain may be there, but from a spiritual perspective, he doesn't even feel that. Right? That death in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Amir al Mu'mineen, he called out, Fuzdu wa Rabbil Ka'bah. That's enjoyable. It's not painful. All right? Then later on in the grave, the descriptions that we read, God forbid if we end up in that situation. The way that body is going to be squeezed, the way the angels are going to come with their balls of fire that they're going to be throwing and striking this person with, and so on and so forth. But what I want to read from the Holy Qur'an in this regard, just a couple. On the Day of Judgment, the descriptions that we have are very severe as well, but then the hereafter. In Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about three groups of people. One of them are Ashabu shimal the bad people. And he describes them. Fi samumin wa hamim. They're going to be in two things. Samum is fire, all right, and flames. The heat is such that it's like a needle, it penetrates, all right. I don't know if you've seen those, I, I don't know what it's called in English, the equipment that they use to try to burn through steel. Okay, it makes a hole through it. That's how hot it is. Okay, that's the kind of impression you get. Samum, this is the type of, one of the punishments. And Hamim, boiling water. Boiling water that is going to be, sometimes the person is going to be drinking it, and we'll read that, and sometimes it's poured upon them, sometimes they're thrown in it, and you just imagine what type of pain that is. And this is a description that is given in our language. All right? Otherwise, the reality of it is not really understood. You say if one flame, one spark of that fire in the hereafter would come into this world, it would destroy, destroy the entire 
world. That's how severe it is. There's a dhil, something that gives you shade, which when it's really hot on a summer day, you're looking for some shade, all right? But it says this shade is not something that you're going to enjoy. It's it's because of smoke. That's what is causing that shade. And la baridin wa la karim. It doesn't cool you off, unlike if you find some shade in a hot summer day when the sun is blazing, it'll cool you off a bit. This is not like that. And then he says later on in the surah, ثم إنكم أيها الضالون المكذبون لأكلون من شجر من زقوم. A tree that grows out of or in hell that has very, very disgusting odor and very bad taste, bad texture and it's not cool one bit. They become, apparently, they become very hungry in hell fire and the only food they can find is what grows on this tree. All right. Then when they take this food they become extremely thirsty. They're looking for something to drink. And that's where the rest of it comes in. It says, min hal butun. They fill their stomachs with that zakum. Then, فَشَارِبُونَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْحَمِيمِ That boiling water. They're looking for some liquid to drink and the only thing they can find is that boiling water. And they start, drink, they start drinking that. All right. They start drinking that there's a disease, a disorder that a camel develops that it becomes so thirsty it keeps drinking and drinking and drinking until it dies. All right? That's called Hayma'ah. The plural of it is Hamim. Sorry, al Hayim. That's the plural of it that's found in this verse. So this person is going to start drinking up the way that camel keeps on drinking and drinking and drinking with only one difference. That camel ends up dying, but in hellfire there's no death. People wish that they would die, but there is no death. It's eternal. So this is something that we want to try to avoid. Now, moving, what do we want... If we remember, we mentioned that this goes through stages, and we mentioned that today as well. According to the hadith of Amin, some people are just focused on trying to avoid this, which is very important. The fear in regards to these punishments should be there. Even Amin al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi in Dua al-Kumayl, you see that he talks about these punishments. And you see that he speaks of fear in regards to these punishments. So it's not like fear of this punishment is bad. No, it's good. It builds us. It allows us to avoid sin. But what we're looking for, the first step is everybody talks about paradise. All right. Jannah. We're all looking to go to paradise. All right. What is this paradise? What is this thing that we're looking for that is prosperity? Let me mention this here. If you remember yesterday we mentioned that for those who look at things from a materialistic perspective, prosperity is just having the joy of their life. Working to have more money so they can go to the club more or go and drink more or go and do whatever they enjoy most. All right. Naturally, the way God has created us, we like to enjoy things. We don't like hardship and difficulty. What Islam tells us is that you have joy that is only limited to this world and it's devastating in the hereafter or you have joy that's eternal in the hereafter all right so prosperity does have something to do with enjoying oneself all right prosperity isn't that you're supposed to be in hardship the way some people describe islam in this world a very harsh 
way of life. Okay, one thinks that being a believer means that you're, you're always supposed to be this very rough and harsh person that doesn't enjoy anything in life. No, it's about enjoying oneself, but the best form of joy, one that does not have any harm in it, that's what Islam pushes us towards. So it tells us about paradise, a life after death, something referred to as paradise, that there's no hardship in it. Some of the descriptions we find in the Holy Qur'an in regards to it. It says, for instance, when you talk about Jannah, okay, Jannah means basically a garden. A garden can't be a garden without trees, right? without flowers, without greens. So that's definitely there. But the description we get in regards to this garden, one of them, again in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi Sidrin Makhdud. Sidr is a type of tree. In this world, that tree has got thorns. Right, that's one of the things. You have the most beautiful flower, you want to go and pick it, it may have some thorns. And some of them give you a heck of a time once you touch that. Alright, so it's beautiful, you enjoy it, but you can only enjoy it to a certain extent. It has thorns on it. If you want to, for those who are into climbing trees, there are some trees you can't really climb them. All right. But these trees in paradise, they don't have thorns. فِي صِدْرٍ مَخْضُودٍ وَطَلْحٍ مَنْضُودٍ Trees that have fruits on them, but a particular one, banana trees, that the bananas are just stocked up from the bottom all the way to the top. Okay. وَذِلِّمْ mamdud. It's got shade that's everlasting. On a hot day, all right, in the summer, you're looking for some shade. If you're outside, if you're in your house under your AC, as long as that electricity works, all right, as long as you have that, the, the fuel to burn, this country has the fuel to burn and to produce electricity where you have your AC going, well, you're, you're good to go. But then if you're outside, trying to enjoy nature, it's not always all that enjoyable. So it gets really sticky hot sometimes. right? And uh, when it's not as sticky, when it's not as humid, if you can find some shade, it'll cool you off. But that shade is not going to remain there. If it's the shade of the trees, the sun moves, and so does the shade. Okay. And if it's clouds as well, that's going to be moving as well. It doesn't remain there. But the shade in the hereafter is always going to be there. You can move in or out of that if you wish, but that's not going to move unless you want it to move, according to other descriptions that we have. Wama in maskub. Continuous flow of cool, fresh water. Well, that's good to hear. His last few minutes on a hot day of the month of Ramadan, all thirsty and speaking for the past hour too. Um, nice, cool, fresh water continuously coming. If you go to some of the most beautiful places, the vacation places that are very high in demand and people want to go, there are certain seasons that people tend to go. It's not all year round, or it's not there every year, even sometimes. You have to go at a certain season to find the cool, fresh water. Some years there's a drought, you don't get that. All right? But in the hereafter, it's a continuous flow of cool, fresh water. وَفَاكِهَةٍ kathira. Loads of fruits, and I'll skip on the rest of the description of paradise because it gives you the picture that sometimes you see for the advertisement of some of these vacation areas where you have the water, the beach, and you know what, standing there as well. And uh, yeah, you have all of that as well. The descriptions are pretty, pretty descriptive, all right? And in some communities, if I were to even translate some of those verses about how these people 
the females in paradise are described, they would think it's inappropriate to even talk about that in public, let alone on the mimba. Okay, well, these are descriptions of the Holy Quran. All right. So all of that is there. All of what people enjoy here, people like to have, that they only have it for a limited time. They have to work their tails off for some time and then enjoy it for two days, three days, a week, two weeks, and then get back to life again. And it becomes boring even after a while. They just want to get back to work. You can't enjoy it for too long. And sometimes people by the time they have acquired enough wealth to be able to enjoy that, they have to watch their cholesterol and they have to watch out for heart attacks and what have you. And they can't really enjoy all the wealth that they have. That's the problem with this world. Okay. And it's very limited how much you can enjoy. All of that is there in the hereafter. But it's something that does not have any pain with it, any difficulty. It's never ending. Now one thing, sometimes, I don't know if I should put this in there or not. People ask about, when you talk about the females, the way they're described there in the Holy Qur'an, then some people ask, okay, so what happens to the women, the believing women? Do they have males available to them or something like that? Um, well, I can give you one verse that tells us something very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fussilat, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ The descriptions in the Holy Qur'an are not all of what you're going to find in paradise and the hereafter. It says, in the hereafter, if you make it to paradise, you are going to get whatever you desire. Whatever you desire. Okay. But the only thing that I like to put in there is, it says that you're going to get whatever you desire, but are we going to desire certain things over there or not? That's a different story. That's a different thing. Men may desire something, women may desire something else. But we know the promise of the Holy Qur'an is whatever you desire, you're going to get in the hereafter. Okay, so this is one thing. This is one definition of prosperity, which is good. It's not wrong. It's not bad to keep all of that in mind and do worship, try to avoid sin in order to reach this. Even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to talk about the true believers, He still talks about Jannah and Paradise. However, there's something that's far beyond this. There's something there in Paradise. Something very enjoyable that is far, far beyond this. Okay. Let me discuss it in the following way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creating us, I think every single one of us has a question in their mind. Why in the world were we created? What was God's purpose in our creation? What was He trying to accomplish? Well, there's a lot to say in regards to that. One being very shortly, uh, I need to say, that we shouldn't treat God's actions the way we perform actions or we do things. We do things because we're trying to acquire something or avoid something. Okay. In other words, we miss out on something. We don't have something. We have a deficiency. We're trying to make up for it. Or there's something that's evil, something that's painful, something that we dislike, that we're trying to avoid. That's why we do what we do. Okay, so we're trying to accomplish something for ourselves. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have anything that He doesn't have. There's nothing that He doesn't have. Alright? And there's nothing out there that's not His creation to even be able to maybe possibly try to harm Him or something that He would want to do something to try to avoid that. Alright? So whatever he does is not because he's going to have any gain in it. 
It has to do with something with the creation. In one of the verses of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this. He talks about differences and he says that people wala yazaluna mukhtalifin. People are going to be in constant dispute and differences. That's how people are going to be. All right? Illa man rahima rabbuk, except for the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful to, God's mercy. And then he follows that by saying, وَلِذَٰلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ For that reason he has created them. Meaning that for that mercy, for that rahma, that is the purpose of creation. Now the ulama go on to explain this and say, look, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bless, if He wants to give a blessing, does He not have the power to give? Does He have the power to give the blessings that He wants? Or, no, He, he needs to, I don't know, acquire something to be able to give it. He needs an instrument or something to get it to someone. Obviously, He has the power. His power is unlimited. All right. So if He has unlimited power, and He's not stingy, He's not greedy, He doesn't have those negative traits, then He would give that blessing. So God is telling us that He has created us for a blessing that has to do with something in the hereafter, but then He has put us in this world in order to get to that. Why not just give it to us? Why not? Why do we have to go through all this difficulty? Why do I have to go through this pain? Why do I have to avoid sins? Couldn't I just be given those gardens and fresh water? Why do I have to fast for that? This is a question to ask and to try to think about. They say the mercy of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all power and He has that mercy, He's not stingy, all of that. But the mercy that He wants to give is not always the same. There's a type of mercy that can be given and can be actually received because can be given has to do with God's power that He always has the power but the receptivity sometimes it doesn't require any prerequisites to receive that blessing alright that blessing is given without any prerequisite without anything the angels, for instance, they're given so much perfection that they work for it. No, they were just given that blessing. In this world, whether you're Muslim, you're Kafir, whatever, whatever you are, you are given sustenance. That is a type of mercy. That doesn't have any prerequisites. As long as you're a living creature, God has created you, He's going to give you the sustenance. Okay, that's a mercy from Him. That's a rahmah from Him. He gives to everybody. In fact, He says that I wish I would, in my language, I'm paraphrasing, I wish I could give the kuffar more in this world. In different verses of the Holy Quran, he says that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in different languages, different wordings. So he gives, that mercy doesn't have any prerequisites. But there's a certain mercy that has prerequisites. It cannot be received. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being to receive a blessing that cannot be received by any being in the world except for the human being. Okay. What is that blessing? The blessing is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in a couple of different ways in the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt and in the Holy Quran. In the ahadith, one thing, one reference that I can make, all of you should know this. What's the intention that you need to make for your prayer in order for it to be valid? Regardless of it being Dhuhr or Asr or Maghrib or Isha or Fajr or even for your fast, what's the intention that has to be there for it to be a valid action? Qurbatan in Allah. What's the definition of Qurbatan in Allah? The proximity of Allah. Reaching the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that we don't really understand. He's created us just that we get close to Him. There's another language that's used in the Holy Quran, this one. 
has been repeated a number of times. One of those references is the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf, a verse that is recommended to recite before going to bed for those who wish to wake up in the middle of the night to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and become some of the true believers. It says there, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Those who desire to meet their Lord, when you reach the proximity, okay, when you get closer to something, you can get closer and closer and closer and closer until you meet that person. That's the maximum, that's the, the final goal. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for a great blessing that cannot be received except for all these hardships and that blessing is the blessing of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you a couple of examples and a verse to hopefully end before Maghrib time. I don't know how many, which of the scholars you're more familiar with and you've read up on to try to develop an understanding of. The Ahlul Bayt, I'll maybe mention that as well, but we'll start with something that's uh, people that, that we are kind of uh, a little easier for us to picture meeting them. Okay. Many people know Ayatollah Bahjat, for instance. They've heard different things in regards to this great scholar who passed away. This very spiritual man. All right. A lot of people who were able, even from foreign countries, even from right here in the U.S., were able to make it there to the Islamic Republic for ziyarah, they would try to make an effort to go and visit Ayatollah Bahjat. Okay? Anybody in the crowd that has had the pleasure of meeting Ayatollah Bahjat? I don't think you just ended up there in the masjid all of a sudden. You had to make an effort, it's a masjid in the back alleys of Qom. Close to the Haram, but you would have to find your way, you would have to ask around to know where that masjid is. All right? And when you go there, if you ever went there, Ayatollah Bahja would come in, pray and leave. All right? You don't get even time to have a conversation with this man. You wouldn't. And even if you would push and shove, there was this guy, they say, this guy came and made his way out of the crowd and just grabbed Ayatollah Bahja's hand and started pulling it to try to kiss it. And they're like, you've got to break his hand. He said, the hell with it. I want to kiss the man's hand. Okay. <laughs> this is how much love some people had for this man. Okay. Even if you try to work your way through the crowd to try to get close to him, the maximum you're going to get is maybe touch his aba or something. That's it. All right. You're not going to even get him to look at you in the face and smile and say salamun alaykum or any of that. It's too many people who just came in, put his head down, walked out, went back home. Okay. There was a brother from the UK when we were in Mashhad a few years ago. and this group had come from the uh, UK, the US, different parts of the US. And uh, they were visiting. We heard that Ayatollah Bahjad is in Mashhad. All these people, would, these youth, who had read about Ayatollah Bahjad and heard a lot of great things about him. As soon as they heard that, they really wanted to see him. Okay. We heard uh, and we asked what entrance he comes, what time he comes. So they went early in the morning, although they slept very late at night. They woke up early in the morning, which is something, especially in the UK, <laughs> For those who've been to the UK, that's not something that people usually do. Okay? They're not early birds there. They start their days at 9 a.m. Um, they woke up early in the morning to go there before he comes to make sure they're just able to walk that, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 meters with him, behind him, just being close to him. And they enjoyed that. Okay? And if that person was introduced to Atla Bahjad, someone that knew Atla Bahjad very closely, would introduce this young person to Atla Bahjad, they would just be mesmerized and shocked maybe for a few days, okay, feeling so great. 
that I had the pleasure of being introduced to this man. And if he would have a conversation with them, speaking to them, asking how they were, and if this repeated itself a number of times, out of this world, with one of the other ulama, I have seen this, witnessed this. There was a conference in Tehran, and uh, they had a meeting with Atla Khamenei. I was there with this group, and we went there to meet him. A lot of these youth had come from different parts of the world, and they had never seen Ayatollah Khamenei. They had only heard about him, maybe seen him on TV or whatever. When he walked in, the guys, the brothers, couldn't control their tears. Okay. Out of the happiness and the joy of just seeing him. And there's a distance, there's like 20 meters between these brothers and him. Okay, Mesmerized with his presence. Imagine... The Imam of your time, Hajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Thank you. These are just the students of the Ahlul Bayt. Just the students of the Ahlul Bayt. How would you like it if you were told that the Imam of your, town, your time is in town? What would you do to get that information? What would you do if you're told that he's in town? How much would you be, be willing to pay to know where, what house he's in, what time? To be able to go there and to feel shy, I know who I am with the sins that I've committed. I'm not sure if I have the courage to go and meet him face to face, but I really like him. And if I were able to peek from the window and see him one glance, just see his face, how would that feel? How would that feel? To have a conversation with the Imam, if the Imam turns around and says salams to you. They say one of the believers who was very kind to his father, it's a long story, I'm cutting it short. When he would go to the shrine of Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi. When he would say, As-salamu alayk, ya Abu Abdullah, he would hear the response. The Imam would respond back to him. Okay. How would that feel? How would that feel? It's nothing. There's no food, none of that. A good example, one of the scholars said, if the Imam of your time would come and say, send you an invitation for dinner tonight at a certain house, would you go there for the dinner? Would you care what the food there is? Would it matter if it's chicken or burgers or Italian food or I don't know, whatever you like best. Or it's just dry bed or there's no food at all. Does any of that matter? None of that matters. What you would go there is just to enjoy being in the presence of your imam. You'd forget about everything else. Okay. For some of us, I'd say, for some of us, it's not, not, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. The example of ulama, some people came in, like Atla Bahja, they would come in and see him on the street. They wouldn't feel any, anything special. Because they hadn't developed that ma'rifah, that knowledge of who this person is, and worked hard to get it, to be able to feel joy in that. For some of us, we feel like that. That's just enjoyable. The verse of the Holy Quran, the last, the ending verses of Surah Al Qamar before uh, the Surah Al Rahman begins, when it talks about the believers in the hereafter, it ends, Inna al Muttaqina fi Jannatin wa Nahar, fi Maqadi Sidqin Inda Malikin Muqtadir. They're in Jannat, they're in gardens, they're in paradise. But that's not what they're there for. That's not what they enjoy. That's nothing. Inda Malikin Muqtadir is the beauty, is what they enjoy. God Himself is what they... The Ahlul Bayt, you enjoy their presence. They're just some of the best manifestations of the Divine. 
just some of the manifestations of the divine, the creations of God. The source of it all is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? This is what we can try to develop ourselves. That is the Holy Quran says, الَّذِينَ يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ Prophet Musa, I'll end with this. Prophet Musa, I think it's in Surah Al-A'raf. After having that very close connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Prophet Musa is known for this spirituality. He's Karimullah. Imagine that, God speaking to you. Right? As I said, the example of the human being, the imam, or below that, the ma'asun, the scholar speaking and just enjoying that, if God speaks to this person, this is Prophet Musa, right? On one of those occasions that he's gone to the mountain, he asks, Rabbi arini anzur ilayk. I want to see you. Right? He's enjoying the presence of God, but he wants more than that. And according to some of the Mufassireen, that example that God tells him, look at the mountain if it remains and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests and there's apparently an explosion and Prophet Musa falls and goes unconscious and when he's back again, he says, I repent. The ulama, some of the ulama say that God was trying to show him that this material world doesn't have the capacity of any more than what you're experiencing. You have to move and transfer to the hereafter to get any more than that. This is the potential that we have, brothers and sisters. When we want to define prosperity Let's not define it at the very low levels. We can define it as a very, very profound concept. And if we set that as the standard, believe me, believe me, believe those who've experienced it, believe God Himself. The experience that you will have in this world, in this life, the joy that you will have, even if you don't have a penny in your pocket is going to be far beyond any other joy. Ayatullah Bahjad has been quoted to have said, if the kings, with all that they have in their kingdom and all that's available to them, would just feel and taste two rak'ah of prayer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would give up everything that they have just for two rak'ah of prayer. Okay? Just for that. Okay? Now this is the standard. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, by the right of the Imam of our time, that he hastens the return of our Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Imam that he helps us develop ourselves, become the true companions, the close companions of our beloved Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of and give good health to all those who are helping the cause of Islam, especially the Maraja and especially and especially the leader. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all of our sins. We ask Him to forgive our parents, our relatives, our grandparents, all believers, those who are in this city, those who are elsewhere, those who are alive, those who have passed away. In this blessed month, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them all of their sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all the believers the hajat and the needs that they have, all the ill to be cured, all the ones that belong to the audience here and all the believers elsewhere in the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all the people of the world of the oppressions that they are facing, insha'Allah. Bin Nabiya wa alihi rahimallah man qara al fatihata ma'as salawat. Momentin, inshallah, in a few minutes we are going to continue our program in Salat al-Maghrib and after Salat we will have Iftar and after Iftar we will have, inshallah, Dua Iftata. Uh, we will have a two Salat, inshallah, on, uh, uh, we are requesting ladies to move to Hall B and C. Uh, we are going to send someone to have a Salat in ladies over there and Maulana will uh, lead the Salat here tonight, inshallah. So please get ready with your zoo.
سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة As the verse of the Holy Quran says رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله No matter what they were engaged in the most material activities such as shopping. Shopping is the most material, I think, for me. I hate shopping. You go there, sisters love shopping. <laughs> um, and, and going out shopping with one's wife, that sometimes becomes a, a little difficult. But spending that time just looking at all those items that are there, the glamour of the dunya. You enter that store, whether it's Walmart or, I don't know, Costco or Sam's or whatever the store you go to, you go there, you have a list of five things, you come out with 10, 15, or 20. The cart is loaded. At least it was before the economic crisis. I don't know what it is like now. But the glamour of the dunya, you go there to shop, you're seeing the different items that are there on the shelves, and you just want all of them. All right? So it's very material, it's very difficult to be there and be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't having a tasbih and just saying la ilaha illallah, la ilaha You could be saying la ilaha illallah and committing a sin. There's a funny story, I think maybe it's a joke, I don't know how real it is. but Angels call from the heavens, is there anyone that is willing to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the ulama looking at the ahadith in regards to it say in this month God is looking for an excuse to forgive people. Looking for an excuse to forgive people. You don't have to do much to be forgiven in this month. That's why the hadith says a person who enters the month of Ramadan and leaves and they haven't even been able to have their sins forgiven is a very, very misfortunate and unfortunate person. Shaqi is the word that is used in the hadith. So we have this great opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make sure we benefit from this, He has made fast an obligation by avoiding the regular blessings, the physical, material blessings that we benefit from and we enjoy on a daily basis, by avoiding them, we're allowing our spirit to grow. Okay. So we said that we want to, inshallah, try to, try our best to enrich this experience, to do a little more, to go beyond the norms, to try to go beyond the bare minimums. As we mentioned, we have Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Uh, Mamini, it is time for Maulana's speech, inshallah, it's almost 8 o'clock. Uh, and we will continue this program of his speech, and if we have enough time left, then we will uh, have a dua iftata before Maghrib. If not, then inshallah, tonight we will have a dua iftata right after Salat al-Maghrib. For Muhammad wa Muhammad, salawat.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقتمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our Imam, please recite the salawat We mentioned in the previous sessions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with a great opportunity. He blesses us every year with this opportunity. The opportunity of the month of Ramadan, a month that He has said one night alone in it is better than a thousand months. He refers to it, He says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرَ What do you know? Referring to the Holy Prophet, not to us. To his prophet, he says, you even don't know how great this night is. All right. Only one night in this month is that great. The Holy Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us some of the blessings. For instance, every night, the angels to get this straight in our head. For those who've read Imam Khomeini's 40 Hadith, a very, very great book. Alhamdulillah, it's one of the books that even the translation is roughly good at least. It's, it's understandable. Unfortunately, some of those books that are translated, for those who've read them, they're not very understandable. Uh, this book, Alhamdulillah, is understandable at least, the translation of it. It's a very, very good book to read for those who are looking to try to develop themselves, develop their souls. Try to become true human beings. Try to become Khalifatullah. He says there in the first hadith, and this is a fact, that being able to avoid all sin and to make sure we perform all the obligations, we don't miss any of them, this is definitely doable by non masumin You can have someone that develops and makes themselves ma'soom in the sense that they don't commit any sin. Because the isma that the Ahlul Bayt have is far beyond this. Okay? The Ahlul Bayt, it's not, a, uh, it's not very difficult to avoid all sin. They're not great because they don't commit sins. Sins are nothing to them. What they are best at is that 